Welcome, everyone. I'm Mark Tokel of KEI. Recent years have been challenging for the World Trade Organization and the international trading system. Progress has stalled at the WTO, and the pandemic has disrupted global trading patterns. We've seen regional trade agreements move forward, and new issues emerge regarding secure supply chains and climate change. To discuss all this, we have two practitioners who know the way around the international trade system as well as anyone. Former South Korean Trade Minister Yoo Myung-hee and Wendy Cutler, formerly of USTR, and now Vice President and Managing Director of the Asia Society Policy Institute in Washington. I now turn the conversation over to Wendy Cutler and Minister Yu. Well, great to see you, Minister Yu. You know, it's been a, a, a busy weekend. The WTO ministerial was just postponed. And I'm wondering, how do you view this postponement? What are the implications for the World Trade Organization and the important work that it has un underway? First of all, it's a great pleasure to see you, especially to see you in person here in DC. Regarding the ministerial conference that was uh, supposed to be held this week in Geneva, this ministerial conference, actually, this was supposed to be held four years after the last ministerial conference. This ministerial conference normally takes place every two years. And this ministerial, it was supposed to be held after four years of, of, from the last ministry and is postponed again. And right now, this multilateralism and WTO is under stress at a profound crisis. So I'm really concerned about uh, this postponement of this um, ministerial conference. Uh, but uh, this, because of this COVID concern, you know, this con uh, I understand uh, they have to postpone it. So what's important is members, they should continue the negotiations, they should continue the preparations for a uh, minister conference because this WTO is at an inflection point. We can go either way, go toward more multilateralism and more globalization or more fragmentation. So this ministerial conference takes place at this very critical point. So it's important to continue our work to make it successful. And do you see any prospects for some of this work being successfully concluded before the, an, another ministerial conference can be held? You know, I'm thinking about, for example, all the work being done to respond to the pandemic. And it seems like the longer you wait, um, the less impactful that work might be. I mean, any chance that that the ambassadors in Geneva with, with guidance from capitals could, could get it together and announce well, the results? Yeah, <laughs> I very much hope that they could do that. But as a seasoned negotiator, you would understand that a lot of things can happen at the last minute in in-person meetings, both at informal and informal meetings that can happen on the margins of the negotiations, making a flurry of proposals, counter proposals, and package deals. That drama would not happen virtually, or that drama would not happen at senior officials level uh, without the political mandate. So I'm afraid that, you know, I very much hope that that could happen, but I'm afraid uh, that we might not have a major breakthrough without in-person ministerial meeting for the time being. So it is to close the gaps as much as possible, because I understand that the fishery subsidies, uh, the negotiations have progressed substantially, significantly these days. So close the gaps as much as possible. And also our response to pandemic is all the more important given the spread of this new variant. So uh, with this sense of urgency, they have to expedite negotiations on this issue so that whenever the conditions allow, the ministers can meet and close the deal on these two important issues. Right. So um, changing the subject now, we're, I, I can't even believe it, we're approaching the 10th anniversary of the US-Korea FTA um, um, existence. And it's been a tumultuous 10 years, a lot of benefits, a lot of expanded trade, expanded investment between our two countries. 
um, I had the pleasure of meeting you during the original negotiations. I worked on the first renegotiation during the Obama administration. You were, I believe, deputy minister during the, the renegotiation during the Trump administration. I mean, when you look back on the past 10 years, how do you assess Chorus? Yeah, before you know, I get into the substantive topic. Just, this question just makes me look back at those days uh, when we <laughs> worked together on Chorus FTA. You were the, as you said, the chief negotiator back in 2006, and I was a young director uh, working as a group lead for competition chapter as well as co-lead for service chapter and then later served as uh, chief negotiator for amendment and negotiations uh, back in 2018. So we both nurtured the growth of the chorus FTA from the very beginning of the talk back in uh, 2006. So now we both retired, but still helping this chorus FTA make our lives better in our own ways. Uh, so uh, we are both you know, deeply invested in the success of chorus FTA. So in that regard, I first I would uh, assess this chorus FTA as a, a success and mutually beneficial to both countries because this has served as a bad bedrock for our economic cooperation, playing a very important role in mutually beneficial economic development. If you look at the just numbers, our trade volume increased substantially for the last 10 years. Not only for the good times, but if you look at the last year, when Korea's trade volume with the world global trade had you know, saw the uh, downturn, sharp downturn. Our trade with the U.S. Uh, remained very steady thanks to Chorus FTA. And this year, uh, our trade with the U.S. increased increased significantly, back to pre-COVID-19 level. So this showed the resilience of our trade relationship. And also, if we we look at the investment. U.S. is Korea's favorite destination for um, our investors, not only in terms of quantity of the investment about, amount, but also we look if you look at the quality of our investment, Korean companies are making investment in semiconductors and EV batteries, all those you know, advanced manufacturing sectors. Uh, just not contributing to U.S. economy through uh, this win-win uh, investment projects and also contributing to uh, job growth in the U.S. So this trade and investment really shows how beneficial this chorus FTA has been to both countries. But also this has uh, been a good experience to Korea uh, in, in terms of market opening. So I'm not sure whether you remember this, but when I was the uh, group lead for, for example, service um, negotiations, I had to also fight against fake news or false rumor. For example, this was the first rumors that I had to uh, fight against uh, back in 2006. Uh, for example, they at, at that time, there was a rumor that the, if we concluded co Chorus, uh, co Korea US FTA, uh, we had to, uh, we would drink Coke instead of water because we could not afford uh, the uh, price of water because the price of water would increase sharply. And also Korean students, you know, Korean senior, high school seniors, they would take SAT instead of Korea's, uh, uh, Korea's exam to go to Korean college, enforced by the U.S. Um, the, uh, U.S. education companies or whatever it is. There was the rumor that we had to fight against at that time. Those things didn't happen. Those basic public services still are provided to Korean people, but commercial professional services, uh, those markets are open to uh, Korean uh, firms as well as to foreign firms, thanks to Chorus FTA. If we look at the legal services, uh, before Chorus, 
there were no there was no foreign uh, legal branch offices uh, in the in Korean legal market. But right now, thirty offices are there providing legal service either to Korean firms or foreign invested uh, companies. Uh, in Seoul or in Korea. So that is the change uh, that were brought about by Korea's FTA. So uh, it has brought about uh, uh, many benefits to both sides. And uh, I hope that this could continue to serve as a very solid, mutually beneficial uh, platform and framework for both uh, to both uh, business communities and both peoples uh, in both countries. I mean, I'll always remember the heated domestic opposition to Chorus as we were negotiating, mm -hmm. particularly um, by the Korean agricultural community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, lots of farmers were protesting. Mm -hmm. They were really worried that mm -hmm. if Korea opened its market to U.S. Mm -hmm. products, that they would no longer be able to grow and sell their, their products. Mm -hmm. um, that did not materialize. And, and I understand that Korea is exporting agricultural goods mm -hmm. throughout Asia and to the United States. So were, the, were those fears unfounded as well? Well, in the agricultural sector, still is very sensitive uh, uh, in Korea. So, well, you know, I still share some of the concerns uh, that they have. But these days, as you said, some of the Korean agricultural products are very competitive. So we can export those products to um, other, uh, you know, uh, markets in, in other countries. Have you ever tried the Korean strawberries? Strawberries? No. Oh, uh, if not, you okay. should do that. So okay. <laughs> that is, you know, one of the very popular Korean agricultural products. Uh, so you should uh, try that. So uh, of course, you know, agriculture is a bit different, more sensitive than uh, commercial professional course, services. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but still, some concerns that they had at that time uh, were a bit uh, exaggerated. So which uh, at that time, we had had a lot of time in convincing and persuading our domestic stakeholders on the benefits of uh, Coros FTA. But right now, after 10 years, looking back uh, at uh, all those benefits that Coros brought us, uh, brought about to us, uh, right now we are quite confident that this could serve as a, a mutually beneficial platform to both countries in the coming decades as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's 10 years and some of the rules, of course, are outdated. And I think of the e-commerce chapter um, and I think of other provisions. Um, maybe an update of the agreement is not politically possible. But how should the United States and Korea work on these emerging issues like data, like advanced technologies, like trade and climate issues, and supply chain cooperation? Can we do this through Chorus, or should we just be doing it in parallel to Chorus? How should we be thinking about these new and emerging issues? There are various ways. We can update the rules, but because we have gone through renegotiation, <laughs> amendment negotiation, I would, I would not go there yet. We can use the vehicle of uh, the Joint Committee under the chorus, Korea US. The Joint Committee meaning yes, the committee joint committee between meaning, the ministers, yes. the two There sides. are various channels under Joint Committee, the working groups and also Joint Committee. So we can use existing channels to have a dialogue on those issues because before we come up with a, a set of rules or guidelines, we first have to explore the topics and regarding the digital and supply chains and technology cooperation. They are all very important and challenging issues these days, and also they need really cooperation, close cooperation between the two two sides. So I think you know, we can take advantage of these existing uh, committees and existing channels. And among the three issues, especially the uh, supply chains, both sides can leverage each other's strength. 
Now, the U.S. has strength in technology, and Korea has strength in its manufacturing, world-class manufacturing capacity. So these days, both sides are close cooperation, having close cooperation on semiconductors and batteries and uh, some of the uh, very advanced industrial sectors. And we can expand these collaborations into other areas as well. For example, uh, the pharmaceutical areas, biopharmaceutical areas such as vaccines. Uh, we briefly talked about before we started this discussion about the new variant. So we are not out of the woods yet. So basically, our battle against COVID-19 is far from, uh, is of, not over. So uh, if with Korea's world-class manufacturing capacity combined together with U.S. technology and biopharmaceutical sector, if we combine those two strengths, we can strengthen our supply chains in um, biopharmaceutical sector, but at the same time, we can contribute to tackling this very important public health crisis in the world. So there are some important new emerging areas where we can expand our collaboration in supply chains. So we can strengthen our supply chain resilience uh, either through existing channels or um, creating new channels rather than just going directly into updating the agreement itself. And you also mentioned digital agreement and especially in Asia Pacific region, there are various these days dialogues and discussions and, uh, and actual agreements. Yes, <laughs> yeah. uh, but those actual agreements also have two components. The first part is rules. There are certain areas like you know, free flow of data, prohibition of localization. But there are also certain areas where rules are evolving. For example, AI, fintech. We still don't know where how to shape the rules exactly. In those areas, we can discuss best practices and guidelines, and we can explore cooperation projects. So with the kind of a partnership agreement in digital area, we can discuss rules as well as we can discuss some cooperation projects and guidelines and best practices. So digital area is another area where we can create something new, either a partnership agreement or a dialogue, uh, combining rules and cooperations. So those supply chains and uh, digital um, trade uh, partnership, those two areas, uh, I hope that both Korea and U.S. could further collaborate in those two uh, very promising areas. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. You know, in trade agreements, traditionally, in U.S. FTAs, they never included kind of cooperation chapters. Other countries have such chapters in their agreements, I believe Korea too. But I couldn't agree with you more that the nature of these evolving, emerging issues really do lend themselves to both hard commitments, but also what I call softer commitments. Um, do you, the, the Biden administration is exploring with regional partners, including Korea, a framework for economic engagement. And under that framework, they've already targeted some issues like supply chains, like you know, um, green technologies, um, like digital standards. Do you see Korea cooperating and working with the Biden administration under this new framework as it involves? Uh, Korea is very optimal partner to work on those issues with the U.S. Uh, still, we don't know the specifics of that framework, so a lot of things need to be actually uh, discussed further uh, between the two sides and also perhaps along with other uh, like-minded countries in the region. But I think that is a very uh, good initiative uh, that could be further explored uh, in the region. Because as you mentioned, our FTA, the traditional FTA, ha includes all the hard commitments in trade liberalization. But there are certain issues like you know, supply chains, uh, green technology, and digital 
uh, trade where we can explore some soft commitments, some ideas. Uh, although at this moment, we are not able to commit to certain hard uh, obligations, but still it's worthwhile to explore corporations. And let's do that together with like-minded countries. Mm -hmm. And it's a very important initiative to tackle those important and new challenging issues uh, in the 21st century. And Korea and the US are optimal partners to discuss those uh, issues. And we can leverage each other's strength. So mm -hmm. I hope that uh, we could further explore and develop uh, that uh, framework. Uh, so hope yeah. to see. I mean, it's my personal case. hope that Korea mm -hmm. would be a strong supporter and a strong partner in such a framework. Of and course. part of this is of based course. on mm -hmm. kind of our experience mm -hmm. on TPP. Mm -hmm. um, initially, um, before the United States left, we were discussing pos you know, the possible participation of Korea. Korea wasn't ready, and by the time it was ready, we basically told Korea it was too late. I believe that was in 2013 when we thought those negotiations would wrap up quickly. There were another, it, it, it took another two years for TPP to be concluded. But now the U.S. isn't in. CPTPP concluded among 11 members. The U.K. now is negotiating accession. And in a real game changer, China, followed by Taiwan six, day late, six days later, has announced interest in joining. Where is Korea in the process? And in, in your view, do you think Korea should join? Do you think the benefits outweigh any cost or concerns? Well, uh, right now, uh, what I can tell you is that uh, we are actively, uh, as far as I understand, Korea as a free trading nation, we are actively considering applying for accession to uh, the CPTPP. When I was a trade minister, we conducted a very extensive in-depth review and analysis of the economic impact of uh, possible accession to the CPTPP and economic feasibility of uh, such accession and all the rules and obligations, requirements of a CPTPP and any improvement needed in Korea's uh, system of laws and regulations uh, in light of those requirements and obligations of a CPTPP. So we are quite prepared, but uh, at the same time, this has very high level of market liberalization, which inevitably requires additional market opening in agricultural sector, which is traditional, very sensitive sector in Korea. So we need sufficient consultation with domestic stakeholders in relevant industries. So we are going through that process, having consultations with the domestic stakeholders and relevant industries. And also we have had informal meetings with individual CPTPP members. So we are gonna make a decision after uh, going through all this process based on the outcome of our study and our uh, consultations and our uh, informal meetings uh, with members. So at the moment, what I can tell you is that I'm just not actively considering, uh, consider, considering applying uh, for the uh, accession. And uh, it takes some time to go through all, all this that, consultation yeah. process. Yeah. Yeah. So Minister Yu, one of your major accomplishments when you were the trade minister was, was the successful conclusion of the RCEP negotiations. And my understanding, Korea wasn't just a member that you personally were very involved and really played an instrumental role in narrowing the gaps and some outstanding issues. Um, yet I note that Korea still has not ratified RCEP. Um, the other, you know, many other partners have and will be coming into effect next month or a month and a half for um, those countries. Where, where is Korea in the ratification process? And is this part of the 
part of the, the issue that you have a very complex and lengthy domestic process for consultation and ratification. So I think you are very familiar with the Korea's <laughs> ratification process, so I don't need to explain I think you how ours. Yes, complex <laughs> it is. But uh, I am personally confident that we will ratify uh, the ICEP uh, agreement uh, in the coming weeks. So we can, uh, uh, I, I think, you know, we will not have a huge problem in uh, ratifying this, uh, this agreement uh, in a timely manner so that uh, this ICEP can enter into uh, force uh, early next year. Uh, so I, I don't see huge problems uh, in our uh, uh, verification process, although uh, it's not an easy process because it, it involves domestic stakeholders. Uh, how to address their concerns in this verification process is important uh, in our process. Uh, but as you mentioned, I also played uh, a, a, a role in uh, concluding uh, this uh, important uh, negotiation, uh, and I became a good friend with all the you know uh, fifteen ministers of uh, ICEP um, members. So uh, I had all their you know uh, messenger apps uh, in my installed uh, all their messenger apps uh, in my uh, mobile phones because some ministers uh, they use uh, WhatsApp. Uh, some ministers, Viber, Line, uh, Kakao, all different, <laughs> all different uh, platforms. Yes, yes. <laughs> so when we were at the final stage of our negotiations, I had to install five diff different apps to <laughs> talk with them directly. So I didn't need to go through my step because I was in direct communication line with all the ministers and we talked with each other to finalize the details, the, the outstanding issues. So what's notable is that this ICEP agreement was concluded amid growing protectionism and also growing uncertainty caused by COVID-19. Especially at the last stage, there were some outstanding uh, final uh, issues uh, before the signing, and those issues were finalized through virtual negotiations. When we discussed MC12, we explain, I explained to you how difficult it would be to conclude negotiations virtually. ICEP has 15 members, uh, and those 15 members are at different stages of development, from least developed countries to advanced economies. Uh, those diverse you know, countries, they worked together virtually to finalize all the last remaining outstanding issues and sign the document virtually amid COVID-19 induced uncertainties and protectionism. Uh, there was very uh, notable, so there was possible uh, due to the trust that we built for the last seven years negotiations among the uh, negotiators and also among the ministers as well. Right. And this ICEP is the world uh, largest FTA uh, in terms of uh, GDP and population and trade volume. And uh, I'm sure that this will uh, increase uh, the free trade among the members in the region and also facilitate trade and investment uh, in the region. And also, especially between Korea and ASEAN, this FTA has updated and modernized our rules and increased our market open to each other. So we'll further diverse, uh, strengthen our supply chains uh, in the region. So my personal hope is that it also serves as a wake up call to the United States to get more active <laughs> on the trade front. Maybe one final question, mm -hmm. you know, as we look ahead, into you know in, in the trade landscape mm -hmm. there is growing protectionism mm -hmm. and it's not just tariffs mm -hmm. it's just you know restricting data non-market economy mm -hmm. practices um, and a lot of countries just looking inward wanting to mm -hmm. shorten supply chains mm -hmm. um, and really questioning you know depending mm -hmm. on others for trade and investment I mean, Korea is a country that is so benefited from an open rules-based mm -hmm. Um, trading system, how, how do you, you know, are you concerned as you look ahead in the trade area and what can Korea do to 
protect and advance its interests? Well, definitely we are concerned about the growing protectionism and the, the trade tensions uh, among the members. Now, Korea is the textbook example of uh, achieving economic growth through trade, especially based on multilateralism. So when the multilateralism is under stress at a profound crisis, uh, we are extremely concerned about the future of multilateralism. That's why we are working very hard at the WTO and other multilateral fora uh, to uh, contribute to uh, revitalizing the multilateral trading system. Actually, that's uh, one of the main reasons why I ran for WTO uh, Director General uh, position. And, and so still, Korea, we are making uh, uh, efforts uh, to contribute to revitalizing the WTO in various negotiations. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we are making those efforts with uh, like-minded countries, uh, for example, such as uh, Australia, Singapore, um, New Zealand. A lot of middle-sized countries, yes, right? Yes, middle-sized yeah. countries. So, when we had COVID-19 crisis at that time, a lot of countries, they erected barriers. Rather than uh, they reduced their barriers, they erected barriers and imposed export restrictions, various restrictions. And those countries, middle-sized countries, we got together and we agreed on certain guidelines and certain uh, the, the principles uh, on, uh, you know, prohibition or what restrain, restraints on the export uh, pro, export restrictions and to make our supply chain uh, open and keep our supply chain open and to have a free flow of goods, services, and people. So we will continue to work together with middle-sized countries to make our trading system open, fair, and free. We will continue to do that. But at the same time, when multilateral trading system has not produced uh, really tangible outcomes for the last 25 years, we are also working with uh, our partners to achieve either bilateral FTAs or plurilateral FTAs to open our markets and to open their markets. This is not the best option but this can be a second best option to open our markets. We will continue to do that. But these days, market opening is one way of making our trading system resilient, but there are another issues or the challenging issues to uh, make our trading system relevant and resilient, newer issues, those are the technology cooperation and supply chain issues, uh, climate change issues. So regarding those uh, new emerging challenging issues, we would like to continue to work with like-minded countries, and especially with the US based on existing good working relationship uh, with Coros FTA as an anchor. We would like to work together with US to tackle those 21st century challenging issues. Right. So, Gosh, you know, our bilateral trade relationship mm -hmm. has, has evolved and improved dramatically yeah. over yeah. the past, not just 10 mm -hmm. years, but mm -hmm. the past 20, 30 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. And it's heartening to hear that we're mm -hmm. just such close partners. Mm -hmm. And as we look at the challenges in the global trading system going forward, mm -hmm. when we look around the world, Korea is one of our closest partners that we, you know, we want to work with very closely going forward. Mm -hmm. So with that, mm -hmm. thank you very much. This has been great to see you again. You look well rested. Um, and I hope we see you reemerge in the trade world again because you're such a force and have so much to contribute. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much.